So now that I've made that entirely clear, let's get to the issue at hand. Which of these venerated numbers, pi or e, deserves to be held in the higher respect? Which of these numbers should be put on a pedestal to which we should bow every day as we pass by? Should it be pi? Just a few digits there. <laughs> Dating back to the Greek antiquities together with the Venus de Milo and the Parthenon? Or should it be E? <laughs> of the Renaissance, embarrassment to Euler, shunned by the neighboring numbers 2.7 and 2.8. <laughs> now, Professor Garrity is going to try to use facts and figures to confuse the issue. <laughs> He'll have formulas and series, integrals and derivatives, but don't let that confuse you. I have facts and figures, too. This briefcase right here is filled with facts and figures, <laughs> all right? But this debate isn't about facts and figures, is it? No, this debate is about what you feel in your gut. <laughs> Which of these two numbers do you love more? Right? Is it pi, pi which is simply defined by taking any circle, and you take the circumference of the circle, and you divide by the diameter of the circle. That's it. You get pi. That's the entire definition of pi. It doesn't just hold for this circle. It holds for any circle you want to pick. You just take the circumference <laughs> divided by the diameter, you're going to get pi. Every circle in the universe has pi embedded in it as a fundamental part of its makeup. Every round frying pan, every can of Diet Coke, <laughs> every doorknob, and even what is arguably the greatest invention of all time, and no, Tom, I don't mean the hula hoop. <laughs> The wheel has embedded in it the makeup, is in its makeup, this magical number. Look around you in this room. Pi is everywhere. It's in that clock at the back of the room, right there. It's in the change in your pocket, the pennies, the nickels, the quarters, the dimes. It's even in that particularly round-headed person sitting next to you. <laughs> but where, where, oh, where is E? Now, that's a good question. Let's talk about the elusive E. Where did E come from? Well, arguably, the first time someone investigated E was in 1683, a mathematician by the name of Jacob Bernoulli. Now, I want to be clear on this. How did he stumble across E? Was he investigating fascinating geometric relationships between the circles, every circle that's ever existed and every circle that will ever exist forever? No. Was he looking for great truths of the universe? No, he was interested in compound interest. That's right. No one knows for sure exactly why, but it was probably that he was strapped for cash. <laughs> After all, you have to remember it was the Renaissance and the price of turnips was going up fast. Okay? So perhaps he went to a money lender, okay? a loan shark, if you will. Now let's give this loan shark a name, say Tom. Okay? <laughs> Bone Shark Tom said, I will give you a kroner now, but at an interest rate of 100% per year. And Jacob Bernoulli, he calculates and he realizes that if he gets one kroner at 100% per year, then after his first year, he's going to owe 100% on that kroner. He'll owe two kroners at the end of that first year. All right? So that says, he says to himself, OK, look. I don't have any choice in the matter. My family's starving. We need the turnips. So he signs the contract. And once he signs the contract, he gets the kroner. Tom, the money lender, gives him the kroner. He spends it on the turnips. OK? But then this loan shark, Tom, says, <laughs> and I should say, this loan shark is a, is a clever fellow, much, much like our Tom here, <laughs> a, a devious fellow. <laughs> And he says to Jacob B, oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you, I forgot to mention, but I decide how often we compound the interest over the year on that kroner. I forgot to mention that. Well, Jacob B figures, OK, that can't be so bad. What's the worst thing that can happen? So he says to himself, what would happen if that kroner, if we compounded the interest twice over the year? OK? So after the first half of the year, he's going to owe one and a half kroner 
But then when they compute the interest for the second half of the year, they multiply that 1 plus a half by another 1 plus a half. So it becomes 1 plus 1 half squared, which is 2.25 kroner. So at the end of the year, he's going to owe 2 and a quarter kroner. On the other hand, he says to himself, wait a minute, well, what if he compounds three times a year? If he compounds three times a year, after the first third of a year, he's going to owe 1 plus a third of a kroner. <coughs> Then I'm going to multiply that in the second third of a year by another 1 plus a third, and the third third of the year by another 1 plus a third. That's going to come out to be 2.37 kroner, getting a little more expensive now. Okay, then he figures, okay, what if it gets compounded four times per year? We can see the pattern now. It's going to be 1 plus a quarter to the fourth, which is 2.44 going up. What if it's compounded five times per year? It's going to go up to 1 plus 1 fifth to the fifth, which is 2.48. Six times per year, 2.52. He's getting a little nervous. This number keeps going up. So he says to himself, well, what's the general case? What if I have this kroner compounded, the interest compounded, n times over the year? That means that the cost, if it's compounded n times over the year, will be 1 plus 1 over n to the nth power. How bad could that be? Well, let's see what happens as n gets large. As n gets large, that number is approaching this magical number E. This is where E is coming from, OK? This is the actual definition of E. It's the limit of this quantity as n gets large. There's the definition of E. It comes from the loan sharks, OK? <laughs> That's where it comes from, all right? Now, having just seen that, let me ask you, which of these two numbers is intuitively the more obvious, all right? Which is the more natural? You could fool around with limits your entire lifetime. You're never going to come up with this number E. But if you fool around with circles, it's going to take you about a half hour to come up with pi. All right? Now, when my son was three years old, I said to him, I said, Colton, what word starts with E? He looked at me blankly. Then he said, Colton starts with C. Very good, Colton, I said. <laughs> then I said, do you like Tom Garrity? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, he's scary, Dad. <laughs> yes, Tom Garrity is scary. And so is his number. E is scary, too. It's cold. It's calculating. It's the tool of the capitalist machine that grinds all the starving academics under its heel. Pie is comforting. Mom's apple pie comforting. I said to my son, that same son, Colton, do you like pie? And he said, yeah, Dad. I like pie. Can I have pie? <laughs> Ask almost anyone, do you like pie? The answer is universal. Yes, I like pie. <laughs> now, I'm not going to bore you with a bunch of details about how much better pie is than E. Details like the fact that the discovery of pie predated the discovery of E by thousands of years. <laughs> For instance, that pi actually appears in the Bible. E doesn't appear in the Bible. Pi appears in the Bible. Actually, it's calculated to be 3, but we're not going to worry about that. <laughs> but it appears in the Bible. Or that the Indiana legislature actually tried to legislate a value of pi. They didn't bother with E, believe me. Okay. <laughs> or, for instance, that the area of an ideal triangle